Hello, and welcome to this edition of Secure Networks, the Endace Packet Forensic Files with your host, Michael Morris. This week's very special guest is David Monahan, Business Information Security Officer. David, hello, welcome. Thanks for joining. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? I don't know if I'm very special. I, I feel all <laughs> good. Now I have to fix my hair. Wait, um, but uh, yeah. So I appreciate the opportunity to be together with you, Michael. Uh, you know, I've been in security, gosh, for close to 30 years now. Uh, you know, in that, I, I've you know, I've worked in, in the pharma industry here. I've worked in the banking industry. I've worked across uh, state and local government. I've worked across a lot of tech companies. So been all over the place. It's been actually a very good career, an opportunity to to do a lot of different things. And uh, you know, and here we are. Well, David, I'm, I'm super happy to have you as part of our, our podcast series because of your broad expertise. And so that's where I want to start. Um, from a high level, what do you see as security challenges common across all industries versus challenges that are very specific to pharma and healthcare? Because we're we're seeing a number of nuances in that space. Uh, there are. And I, I think the first thing just to, to bring out is data protection is data protection. Mm -hmm. Everybody you know, who's on the Internet, it seems like every company has something to protect, mm -hmm. uh, intellectual property of some kind or whatever, uh, health data, personal data, you know, whatever. But data mm -hmm. from that perspective, data is data. And we have to put controls in place to protect and to monitor it. Now, uh, you know, from from there, we can we can drill down as well. But I'll hit on one other common aspect as well. And, and uh, with. Um, with multiple industries. So this isn't necessarily a common across everyone, but let's say manufacturing uh, organizations, mm -hmm. whether you're making uh, medications, uh, car components, uh, power management systems, you know, whatever it is, in manufacturing, you have to uh, you have a, a numerous regulations that you have to follow, uh, and therefore you have to protect based on those uh, those sort of those requirements. One of which is these uh, these the uh, compact and or enclosed systems, these fixed mm -hmm. systems. So, for example, we have medical devices. Mm -hmm. Car manufacturers have their their CPUs, uh, power management systems, and so forth. And so the, the tough part of that is we create these devices that are meant to do something, whatever that is, and then we put them out in the market and they can stay there for literally some of them can stay there for decades. And, and you, you may have a windows operating system base. You may have a Linda, right. Linux operating system base, but once they're out there and they're certified, you can't change them. You can't add endpoint security. You can't add patches. You can't do anything with them unless you go through this very arduous and costly process of recertifying them. So, mm -hmm. so from that perspective, it's a challenge uh, across manufacturing industries uh, for these types of devices. And, and we have to we have to be aware of that because ultimately that's that's where I think a lot of our nightmare begins, if you will, because right. we have systems that we it's not like a desktop, right? Where we can just go, oh yeah, let's just put the latest patch on, boom. It's you know you just you can't do that. Um, something that's different, I think, about us is the. Uh, the fact that you have many different people uh, in, in healthcare in different roles. So uh, you know you'll you'll have your your doctors, your nurses, your technicians, da, 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 you know across a hospital. Then you have your your pharmacists and all the people involved in that, uh, and and so forth, right? Whether that's for an aesthetic aspect or whether that's for an actual medical health issue, there's all these people involved, and you have to be able to allow these people access to certain types of uh, data within the profile of the patient to be able to do their jobs. And at the same time, you're trying to protect that data from everybody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, that's a very difficult and, and, and tricky challenge for healthcare and pharmaceutical areas uh, because of that, right? And, and we've seen uh, plenty of lawsuits in the past, especially from like celebrities, because some uh, technician or doctor, nurse, whatever it was, wanted, oh, let's see what this celebrity's file says and what right. they've had done. And, and and of course, the, fortunately, on the hospital side, they were monitoring that and identified an inappropriate access, and and they were able to, uh, to 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 deal with it. But it does cause potential issues. So that's something I think that is relatively special to, right. uh, to our our areas because we we do have to make sure that we give access, but but don't. Right. That's that's tough. Uh, and and the, the last one is I think what that's different is when we talk about these medical devices and uh, and and what could happen if they are compromised. If someone compromises your car, yes, you could be injured or killed. If someone compromises your your uh, 
web enabled coffee maker, probably not so much, but if they compromise your insulin pump or your uh, pacemaker or some other type of medical device that's altering your body or body chemistry, right? That, that could be deadly literally right. instantly, if not in a very short period of time uh, without remediation. Uh, so, so that's something else that we have to be worried about with these types of devices. And, and of course, we've seen at Black Hat over the last I think it's probably a decade, but at least yeah. seven seven years, a different tests that have been done and examples have been done with uh, these devices and how they can be uh, accessed uh, uh, inappropriately and then changes made. In fact, if, if you recall, uh, even, even farther back with uh, uh, Vice President Cheney had a, uh, mm-hmm. a pacemaker and the Secret Service uh, and the medical area in the Secret Service turned off the wireless component of that to be in, ensure that he could not be attacked, literally, you know, attacked remotely uh, and, and injured or killed, you know, via his pacemaker. So, so that's another example. No, that's th- those are super great examples of the sensitivity, right? Life and death sensitivity of of personal information and and health healthcare services. So, you know, I think that partially hits my next question, but why is the healthcare industry such a popular target? Uh, because it is a target rich environment. Right? <laughs> right. And and whether that's whether that's from the device aspect because you've got something that sits on a network and doesn't go anywhere, doesn't do anything and people really uh that deal with it every day don't have really any understanding of what's going on, on the backside with the software and network components and so forth. Uh, and, and we also have a, a very rich record source. So if you think about a, a, a PHI, a personal health, uh, PHR, personal health record, uh, they have every piece of data that you need to impersonate somebody's identity. So, you know, historically they have been the most valuable because you've got name, address, social security number. You probably have a payment form or, or m- multiple payment forms. Uh, and, and you also have this medical history. So, so, you know, from that perspective, very, very valuable. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned earlier, you know, if you have someone that's, that's famous, that's undergoing certain uh, procedures, again, whether it's aesthetic or whether it's medical health related, uh, those right. can be very valuable from uh, a tabloid perspective or even potentially for impacting a, uh, 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 someone's, someone's career. If you think about the the television example going way back, um, The West Wing. If you remember that show with Martin yeah. Sheen, uh, you know he had he had um, what do you have muscular dystrophy, I think, or multiple sclerosis. He had a, he had an ailment, right? And one of the one of the storylines they had was that got revealed in I, for one of the seasons. And my wife loved the show; she watched it all the time. <laughs> but, but but the point is, is that that affected his presidential candidacy in the show right. because now he has this ailment that he didn't disclose, and that right. could be that could be impactful to uh, someone for from an acting perspective, from a politician, you know, whatever the case is. If it's something that requires some level of personal fortitude, and you no longer have that, right? And we can release that. Wow, I can I can knock you out of the running for whatever this thing is, or impact a stock value or, you know, whatever the case is. Well, clearly, in it, let's say it's an athlete, a pro athlete of some sort, exactly. right? I mean, that could end their career, so to speak, depending on the Absolutely. issue. Absolutely. Right? right. Or no, it could impact their salary, right? I mean, if you, if yeah. you figure you know that they have a tendon injury, right, and they're coming up to the uh, the draft, if that got out before the draft or even after the draft, that could significantly affect their career. Right. Absolutely. So that, that brings the question, are there things as consumers or customers or patients, you know, of these healthcare systems and environments and and pharmaceutical studies in 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 various natures that those individuals can be doing to protect themselves individually and more importantly probably what responsibilities do these companies and industries have to their patients and data records well I, i'll go backwards cuz the, the first one's easier from a, from <laughs> yeah. a patient perspective right keep track of your your documents your receipts and so forth if you don't need them shred them if you do need them keep them secured in some fashion don't leave them in your car or they're just <laughs> laying around uh, you know if you take them to work because you go to a doctor's appointment during work hours don't leave them laying around your desk you know, anything you throw in the trash is considered public domain once yeah. it leaves the building. So you, you don't want that stuff to go in, intact into the trash, mm-hmm. uh, you know, from a uh, from a, pr- a professional perspective. Right? I think that the healthcare companies and and the, the hospitals and so forth, they, they've had that wake up call. As I mentioned, you know, in the last 10 years or so, there's been a number of lawsuits mm-hmm. and they really are trying to ensure that they've locked down the records and information as much as possible. You know, they are uh, they are performing. Forming uh, access control checks 
uh, both on the incoming side, you know, do the people that, that have access, are mm. they required to have access? And if the people that are accessing it, you mm. know, did they access it in a responsible manner? Are they supposed to be accessing it at that time or given that context uh, and, and those kinds of things? So uh, I think from a, from a business perspective, are they all perfect? No. Or, or, you know, can mistakes be made? Uh, you know, a- absolutely mistakes can be made. But I think that, that they've really come around heavily to do their due diligence. I know, you know, for example, at our company, we are we are doing as much as we can to, to you know, secure the information for both healthcare providers that we work with and for the the healthcare consumers that we work with we mentioned botox earlier and other products as well um but you know you know there's lots of famous people that use our products and and you know we have information on some of them at least if not all of them that use our product and and we make sure that that information is secured in an appropriate manner because you know we don't we don't want to lose their trust as a as a patient and a consumer nor do we want it to impact our our brand no it's That's an excellent point. And it's back to the sensitivity of some of the information there. So one area of risk that I'm hearing regularly about, um, you know, in in a lot of these hospital environments in particular, but I'm sure it's somewhat true in pharmaceutical manufacturing environments as well, is the number of IoT devices, right? And you mentioned it earlier in your kind of intro, a lot of these devices are older, right? Um, They're certified when they were built and they're secure. And in many cases, as you said, you can't install endpoint software on, right? Which um, you know gives a level of uncertainty, but then it gives a level of certification, right? So, um, but if there is compromises found, it opens up that, that potential backdoor access mm-hmm. into the network, right? And and that so that's the security fear or risk, shall we say? Yeah. Yeah. So, what are you seeing across the industry to really manage that risk, both for legacy devices and new equipment being being built? A lot of it, I think, comes down to network structures, right? If you think about a very large flat network, which is what many of them have been traditionally, it makes it very easy to, if someone gets on the network, to then begin to to scan that network, move laterally, and find those devices. Uh, I think a lot of companies, uh, healthcare companies, have moved to segmenting their networks uh, more strongly. Right. Uh, and, and depending upon the amount of dollars and time that they've had, uh, you can take these various types of, of uh, equipment. Let's let's look at a, a hospital room as opposed to a specialized uh, area like a like an MRI machine. But if you look mm-hmm. in a room, you've get you've got the various machines that monitor uh, oxygenation and and heart rate and all that kind of stuff. And many of those are becoming or have become IoT enabled. If you can then, uh, from the device perspective, uh, firewall that off, if you will, uh, either at the network switch layer mm-hmm. or, or you know and or use internal firewalls of other types to do that. That helps a lot, right? Segment yeah, it so that if someone does get to a particular place in the network, getting to the next place is much, much harder as opposed to just, hey, I'm on the network and I can just start you right. know, jumping all over the place. So I think that's one thing is to segment those networks. Uh, and then additionally, there are there are vendors that provide uh, um, off-box monitoring and, and fixes, right? So so okay. from, a, uh, from a technology perspective, you can look at the information coming across the wire that, uh, and they're going to scan that information and look for it. Now there's two different aspects. So there's one, like, for example, what Endace does where you're actually capturing network packets on the whole and analyzing them. And when some of these vendors have a little more specialized approach to them, uh, whether that's, you know, from a, uh, uh, um, a protocol perspective and what should be in the packet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that could, that can be very, very useful too. Additionally, if, if you are capturing network packets, you can use other tools on the backside with custom scripts and, and things like that to be able to monitor for known key events or activities. And that's very important. But I think like the foundational is, is segment your, your areas as much as possible so that you, you know what should be in that area and, and traffic that's not supposed to go, uh, you know, it does, isn't allowed. You know, if we think yeah. about also um, from a firewall perspective, uh, you know, other devices or other systems, excuse me, you can you can put on host firewalls, which you can't right. do on these these newer uh, these these uh, medical devices. Yeah. So so you have to figure out a compensated control to keep those protocols from being exchanged back and forth. Does that answer your question? Did no, I it's right? it's it's spot on. You, you hit a big point. I was I, I've I've been hearing a lot about you called it network segmentation. The other term, walled gardens, right? Of mm-hmm. ring fencing subnets of the infrastructure where maybe more of your IoT devices are. Um, and so I, I think you nailed it on the head. Um, are, are there takeaways or best practices that healthcare environments and pharmaceutical industries that they're doing that others should be really adopting? I mean, obviously you mentioned, you know, 
continuous capture that we do, but uh, are there other things that that you see could be leveraged across the industry? Well, uh, you know, aside from that, you know, we mentioned segmentation, right? That that's good for anyone Absolutely. that has, especially if you have different environments. Uh, if if everything's supposed to be the same, maybe that's okay. But even then, I think it's better to compartmentalize them so that if you do have an issue, it it isn't allowed to spread, you know, rampantly. If we think about the old days back in like the late '90s when you had Code Red and <laughs> SQL Slammer and those kind of things, a lot of those flat networks just they got eaten up, yeah. right? Because this yeah. stuff just could scan everything, drop the worm off and keep going and we've had smaller similar issues since then but those were those were some of the the, the behemoths of, of the time if you will uh you know today we get ransomware if, if you have the ability to if the attacker has the ability to move easily laterally then they're gonna they're gonna get more and more of your systems uh, which is going to make your mm -hmm. your business impact and your ransom both go up significantly yeah. so, so i think those are important as well um, I, I think from uh, from additional perspective, you know, the identity and access management controls, there's been a lot of that zero trust conversation in the last six years ish. Uh, you know, that those are those are huge for, for, for a lot of environments. Yeah. Right? If you assume zero trust and then build out from there to allow the entities that you want to communicate to communicate, then you're going to be in a much better position than going the other way around. And you know that's something, for example, that, that packet capture can help with, because if you're looking at whether it's firewall logs, network package uh, capture, excuse me, IDS, et cetera, you can use those types of logs to be able to know what is contacting your devices and then determine, okay, of these, what should be or what shouldn't be, right? What, what's allowed, what's not. So so those, those are also very good. I, I don't know that there's there's um, much that we do specifically that is unique to what we do in terms of protection. Okay. Right? We, we just use, we just have to use different techniques to protect our special IOT devices. Uh, right. and, and some other company may not have to use that, but all the foundational stuff is pretty similar. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. And, and it's funny you mentioned zero trust because uh, you know, the premise of it is Never trust, always verify, and I, I, you nailed it on the head. There's a number of ways to do that, and certainly network captured data is kind of the ultimate verification piece, right? So, from along that lines, from a tools and solutions point of view, uh, what are some th things you think are critical for every healthcare provider and or pharmaceutical manufacturer should have in their environment that many may or may not have yet? You know, I can't speak to what they do or, or don't have, but some of the things that I think are very important is you foundationally, you have a SIM of some kind, yeah. like whatever, whatever, whatever you want to, you know, tool you want to use that's best for, for your use cases. Uh, but you've got to have a, a, a good place to collect your logs, get them into one place and, mm -hmm. and do the analysis. Right. So, so from that perspective, uh, there's, there's a number of different terms for, for SIM at this, at this point, but, but we've got to have something like that to get, and you know, whether, and whether that particular SIM has user behavior analytics on it, or whether you're using a different tool uh, plugged into that, yeah. you know, something in that, in that ballpark, because you do need yeah. the analytics and the AI components of, of a number of these vendors are, are very good at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not that they're going to be plugged in and do everything boom, but, but, you've got a good foundation and they have things that you can start with that you can tune with to get to where you need to be. Uh, of course, you know, endpoint is, is a table stakes at this point endpoint, yeah. whether you want an XDR or antivirus or malware, there's different uh, aspects of that, mm -hmm. but you've got to have something to protect your endpoints because that's the first area of incursion for most, you know, because someone's going to click on a link in an email and, you know, pop goes the weasel, you, you know, your system is owned and everything starts from there. Right. Um, we also, you know, from, from a, from a tool perspective, I think, uh, you know, SOARs and XSORs are, are, are really coming into their, their own at this point for, for, especially for the larger companies like mm. this to, to help with, uh, <laughs> with, uh, you know, playbooks and, and mm. execution. And of course the, 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 you know, you've got your firewalls and IDSs, and those kind of technologies, those are table stakes table as well. Stakes. Yeah. But then, you know, network visibility is another one, right? What, what kind of tools are you using to, to provide that uh, um, not only historical, but real time, both, you know, network mm -hmm. visibility when you have an issue. I mean, for example, in a ransomware attack, knowing, uh, being able to look back on, on, the network and see what's gone on, not just in your logs, but from a packet perspective to see what happened 
uh, you know, that can be very valuable because, of course, as we know, once someone gets on a system, they can erase the logs. So logs may tell you everything's happy. It was all, we're all good. Right. But the network doesn't lie. Everything touches the network at some point. Right. It's yeah. uh, or ninety nine point nine percent. I actually wrote a paper on that, you know, some years ago, because, uh, you know, if you if, if you're going to be an attacker, unless you're sitting at the keyboard and that's the only system you're going to hit. It, it touched the network. There's yeah. something out there that, that you could hopefully capture and, and find. Do you have that tool available and going? Maybe, maybe not, but hopefully, hopefully you do. So, so I think those are some, some valuable tools. No, that's a great point. I think I remember that paper of yours too. So, <laughs> so let's talk about uh, training a little bit, right? Expertise. One, one of the challenges I know every organization is, is staffing and resourcing and, and the, the right level of expertise to solve some of these really hard problems. What can be done more for the training and expertise side of the uh, of the equation for SOC teams uh, around people and processes? Because oftentimes people or processes are some of the weaker links in the cybersecurity mm-hmm. chain, right? So any thoughts you'd, you'd recommend to our listeners on that? Yeah, I think from, from that perspective, one of the areas you have to be careful of is, is the personality trait of the person who wants their fiefdom, right? I have all my knowledge. I am the cowboy. I am Superman, whatever. And I'm going to keep that knowledge to myself uh, because that keeps me important. Right? Yeah. I, I think that in today's environment, you really need the people that are willing to share that environment because there's yeah. plenty of tools and lots of cool stuff out there. Um, but there's, there's something about human intuition from a professional who's been doing it for a while that can really help get to the root cause faster. Uh, and then that can be used to build up your playbooks and your mm-hmm. use cases. So, so I think from a training perspective, it's letting the, the noobs or whatever, the less experienced people work with the more senior professionals and, and having that mentor relationship. Yeah. Right? And I know it takes time. It takes overhead. You know, it's, oh, it's just easier to, to do it myself than to tell you, but ultimately it's not because you need to be able to scale and one person doesn't scale. So I, so I think that one of the biggest things is mentoring, uh, you know, certificates are great. And, and the uh, attack based trainings that you can go to are, are, are fantastic yeah. as well. They'll definitely help. So I think those are another, a number of companies that offer various attack simulation trainings, you know, escape rooms and those types yeah. of things that you can do to, to build their, uh, their skill sets. But ultimately I think the mentoring is a, is a big one. So everybody who comes in should have a mentor that can help them learn what's currently there. And then hopefully the, the new person has some, some different ideas on maybe this is how we can improve a process yeah. or something like that. That's a great point. I, I, I love the mentor part. And I'm glad you also mentioned the, the simulation stuff, right? I've, I've heard more and more uh, CISOs and BISOs like yourself basically mention you know, you got to have fire drills, right? You, you don't know what you're doing until you go through the fire drill. Um, and and by fire drill, I mean a cybersecurity fire drill. So so last question I always like to ask our, our industry experts like yourself, what is one thing you really recommend to our listeners to kind of keep an eye out for over the next six to 18 months? And I know 18 months is an eternity in this space. Um, but, you know, as they're thinking about their cybersecurity strategy and their their infrastructures what are what is something you you think people need to keep a, an eye out for hmm now when you say an eye out are you thinking about like technology style or 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 is there something else that you're I'm trying to figure out what you're either, what you, either you one look out either for? a trend uh I mean you mentioned ransomware uh, a number of times and I, obviously I know in the healthcare industry that's been a hot topic right um is there something around ransomware as an example is is there uh, you know, there, there's a lot of debate on that right now with, with the um, to pay or not to pay, right? And mm-hmm. and so many industries are t- trying to decide for themselves. And of course, you've got the the security agencies saying we should never pay, right? But uh, right, right. So it can, it can be any of the above. Yeah, it can be so tools. The, it can be things on the tool. On sure, the sure. So so a couple of things, you know, from the from the the ransomware perspective, right? One of the things that we're we're seeing is is that it's actually becoming less and less about the uh, the encryption, but the data theft, right? Because we're seeing a two pronged attack in in ransomware, and that the one is I'm going to encrypt your data so you can't use it, but the other is before I encrypt it, I'm going to siphon it out of my out of your network so that I can then double uh, double whammy you because you're going you to pay me yeah. to you know decrypt the data, and then oh if you don't want me to release it to your competitors or on the internet or you know whatever the case is, you're going to pay me again. Right. And there was an article that came out actually uh, in, in a parallel to that. It was uh, I think it was one of the news agencies, uh, CBS, I think it was, or ABC, put out an article that said that 80 percent of successful ransomware victims are attacked again. 
yeah. either from a back door or from something else that the, that the uh, attacker had been able to gain uh, data, et cetera. And so think about it once, you know, you, they're going to try and get you again. So I think the first thing to look out for is, is um, you know, how you're, how you're encrypting as much of your data as possible so that if, someone does get it, it's useless to them. That that protects you from the exfiltration perspective. Uh, and then, you know, from your identity and access management, remember, a, a ransomware can't encrypt something that the person it's impersonating doesn't, or the user it's impersonating doesn't have access to. So if you're giving everybody root access to your laptops, you know, that's, you're asking for trouble, right? Yeah. You, you, and, and I know people want it, but but you've got to, you've got to limit access and limit write capabilities. And so I think that's, but additionally in that, I think, so we'll see some trends around, around the change in the attacks of ransomware and data encryption is going to help with that exfiltration aspect. Very, very few companies encrypt as much of their data as they can. Um, uh, additionally to that, you know, I'm not really sure I have to pull up my crystal ball and my Karnak hat and put it <laughs> on here and, and, and see what else I can do. But I think that. um, we're going to continue to see an, an uptick in attacks from the smaller groups. We're, we're seeing mm. uh, um, law enforcement break break into the, the larger groups and try and break them down. But unfortunately, that creates a pattern of vacuum. And so instead of having one big group, you have lots of smaller groups trying to build themselves up again. Yeah. So I, I don't think we're going to see that go away. I think we're going to see increased variance in attacks as the larger groups are dismantled and the smaller groups you know, begin to infiltrate their way up again. That's, that's something else I can say. Oh, I think those are both great points. I mean, the, the, the stat you had about 80% of folks being re, re-breached after initial, I, that's one to take away for sure. Um, yeah. and, I, and I liked your answer around making sure you're encrypting traffic. So if something is compromised, it can really only be used once, right? So um, David, well, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your tremendously busy schedule to, to join us and share your insights and how to better secure networks. We'd ask our listeners to tune in next time for another edition of the Endace Packet Forensic Files. For more information about Endace's network packet capture platform and our integrations with our fusion technology partners, please go to endace.com. David, again, thank you for taking some time and uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too, Mark. Take care. All right.